There is a phrase in English which when we do not understand something and goes beyond our comprehension, we say, God knows. In other words, what we really mean is that we cannot understand it, we cannot comprehend it, we cannot fathom it, and we leave it in God's hands. Only God knows, we do not know. Today, on Good Friday, I would like to use this phrase in a totally different sense, in the sense that God does know. And the reason is, not only because God is all-powerful, not only because God is almighty, but because God revealed in Jesus is a God of love. No greater love does anyone have for another than that a person is willing to lay down their lives for their friends. And today, the Lord has laid down his life for the whole of humanity, not for a select group of people. I want to use this phrase, God knows, as the theme of my homily, and I want to take it on three levels as applicable to three individuals within the gospel and a little outside. The first person I want to apply this phrase to is Jesus himself. We read from the Gospel of John the whole passion narrative. And if the word passion is used in the sense of suffering, there is no suffering in the Gospel of John. And therefore, when we use the word passion for the narrative in the Gospel of John, we use it in the sense of the mystery. Because in John, Jesus is very willing to go to his death. Jesus wants only to do the will of the Father, and so his food and his drink is to do the will of God. When Simon Peter draws a sword in the garden, and when he cuts off the high priest slaves right here, and the slave's name was Malchus, Jesus would not resort to violence and tells Peter that he too must not resort to violence because Jesus says, Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? So in other words, the whole of the life of Jesus was a life in which he knew that God knew. He knew that God knows. So if Jesus was willing to go to his death, it was because he knew that the Father would raise him on the third day. And the Father did. There is no Gethsemane in the Gospel of John. There is no agony in the garden in the Gospel of John. There is no agitation in the spirit of Jesus in the Gospel of John, as a matter of fact, there is serenity, there is calm, there is peace, and there is a willingness to go to his death. When the arresting party comes to arrest Jesus in the garden, he does not run away, he does not hide, but he gives himself up. And he gives himself up by revealing himself as the I am. The Greek words ego and are translated in English as I am and refer to the divine name. 
the same name which God gave to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 before Moses could be sent out to the Israelites. And when he asked God for a name, that was the God revealed, the name God revealed. And this is the name which Jesus reveals to the arresting party, ego, ego. I am, in other words, Jesus reveals himself as a God who gives himself to the mercy of others. He gives himself so that others can do with him whatever they want. He gives himself so that others can arrest him and they can try him and they can scourge him and they can ridicule him and they can crucify him. But the reason Jesus is able to do that so courageously is because he knows in his heart that God knows. His father has promised him that death will not be the end. His father has promised him that he would raise him on the third day and Jesus believes that promise unconditionally. Jesus will have no doubt in his mind whatever that the promise of the Father would come true. And because Jesus knows that God knows, he was able to spread his arms out on the cross in that firm knowledge. The second person to whom this phrase refers is our Blessed Mother Mary. The Gospel of John speaks about Mary at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, when Jesus worked his first miracle in the Gospel of John at Cana in Galilee, where he turned water into wine. In that miracle, the mother makes no request of her son. She simply points out to the situation in these words. They have no wine. She does not ask Jesus to turn water into wine. She does not ask Jesus to help. She does not ask Jesus to come to the aid of the bridal party. She simply says they have no wine. Why? And the initial reaction of Jesus is to speak with his mother about the hour set by God. Is to tell his mother that her place comes second after God. To tell his mother that she must know her place when he says to her, Why do you turn to me? My hour has not yet come. In other words, as far as Jesus was concerned, the hour set by the Father was primary and no one could hasten that hour. No one could hurry that hour. That hour set by the Father was set by a Father at the definite time. And so Jesus tells his mother that her please must be known by her that she cannot have first place in his life because the first place is given to God. And Mary responds as she does throughout the Gospels serenely. She responds calmly. She responds without agitation. She responds without being upset or angry. She simply says to the stewards that she keeps saying to us, Do whatever he tells you. And this is the strongest point of our Blessed Mother who will always tell us that we must do whatever Jesus tells us. She will always lead us to Jesus. Do whatever he tells you. And the same Jesus who said his hour had not come, 
the same Jesus who implied that the ark could not be hastened or hurried is the same Jesus who now because of the pointing out, not the request, but because of the pointing out of his mother, turns water into wine. So he works the first miracle in the Gospel of John simply because his mother pointed out to the situation even without making a request. This shows us that Mary was present at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, was with him in that ministry. It also shows us the regard, the respect, and more importantly, the love that he had for his mother and how he regarded her word. And even though it is not mentioned explicitly, we can feel the presence of Mary through the Gospel of John because she is present again at the end of the Gospel, standing along with the beloved disciple at the foot of the cross. And if Jesus referred to his mother as woman, which was not really a bad term, but a distancing term. He uses the same term now to refer to his mother when he points the beloved disciple to her as her son. When he says to her, Woman, this is your son. And to the beloved disciple he says, This is your mother. And the consequence of the beloved disciple hearing the words of Jesus is that the beloved disciple took the mother of Jesus into his own home. The beloved disciple is anyone who loves Jesus, not merely a historical figure. And so if we profess to love Jesus, we are being invited to take Mary into our own home. And the consequence of taking Mary into our home is that she will keep pointing out to Jesus when our lives have been wine. She will say to her son, he or she has no wine. And even though Jesus will respond that his hour has not yet come and that the hour cannot be hastened, he will accede. He will hear his mother's words and he will turn the water of our lives into wine. So Mary knows that Jesus knows and because Jesus knows, God knows. If Mary could respond and not react to situations, if she could ponder God's word in her heart, if she could be serene and calm in every situation, it will go because Mary knows that God knows. So the situation might not seem to be as she would want it to be. The son might respond to her with what might seem to us as agitation. And yet Mary knows that God knows. And the third character, both within the gospel and outside, is you and me. Jesus and Mary have shown us emphatically that no matter what the external situation might be, no matter how challenging the cross might be, no matter we are being persecuted from every side, we are not going to be crushed. If people speak ill about us, if people malign our names, if people persecute us, if people are belligerent towards us, if they are obnoxious and if they do all kinds of evil against us, we must keep in mind two things. First, 
that Jesus had said this would happen numerous times in the gospel. And we know that God knows. Like Jesus and like Mary, we respond and we react. And we respond with serenity, we respond with calmness, we respond with courage and fearlessly. The definition of a Christian, the definition of a disciple of Jesus, according to me, is to be fearless no matter what the situation, no matter what the consequence, no matter how heavy the cross. There are times in our lives when we are tempted to give up because the cross is too heavy. There are times in our lives when, like Jesus, we wonder whether God is really listening to our prayers. There are times in our lives when we wonder whether the Lord will indeed turn the water of our lives into wine. There are times in our lives when we imagine that the Lord has been crucified and made in the tomb never to rise again. There are times in our lives when God seems absent everywhere. It is at those times we look at the Lord. It is at those times we look at our Blessed Mother and are inspired by what? To say that God knows. Like them, we do whatever we have to do. And then we leave the rest to God. Like Jesus, we say, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Like Jesus, we say, it is accomplished. And like Mary, we say, let it be done to me according to your word. Aristotle, centuries ago, had said that humans are rational animals. René Descartes, the French philosopher, took it one step further when he said, Dumito ergo cogito, cogito ergo sum. Because I doubt, I think, and because I think, I am. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. I take it even one step further and I say, because God knows, I know. Or, I know because God knows.